What's up, Grace? Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and we are going to dig in. And I'm going to go ahead and right up front uh, tell you we're going to be talking about sex today and God's gift of sex. And so if you have children that you haven't had the birds and bees talk with, I'm not getting graphic or anything, but there might be questions that come up you don't want to answer. And so you can check them into Grace Kids if you want to do that. And you're like, well, what if they're 14? Ah, they'll, they'll be fine. They'll be fine. But now I want to I want to talk about this because I think the the church actually uh, has kind of done a bad job about this over the years, and so uh, I'm gonna open up the word of prayer uh, because I can say something stupid and I don't want to do that. Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity that I have to preach your word today, and I never want to take that for granted. And God, while while I love the fact you've given us clarity on how we can be saved and how we can be free. You have also given us clarity on how to live. And God, your instructions, have they, they touch every area of life. And so I just pray that as we talk about what is for some people, uh, something they're kind of stressed about, I pray that you would actually uh, do a healing work. I know this is gonna be, some of what I'm gonna talk about, there's gonna be all kinds of reactions to this. And I just ask for your will to be done and that they would not hear uh, just a guy uh, sharing opinions, but Father, that they would hear your word and I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak. And so God, we just dedicate this time to you. Keep me from saying something stupid. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> All right, here's the deal, guys. We're gonna, we're gonna jump in. And I, I, I told Lori, my wife, as, we, as I was preparing this week, I said, man, I feel like I'm uh, walking like on an area that there are like landmines everywhere. Like I could lose a leg before this thing's over with. And so what, what I know is that there are a lot of people, different backgrounds, you've been raised different ways, all this sort of thing. You have different pasts. Some of you can have shame in your past. Some of you got all kinds of uh, stuff, regrets. Uh, some of you have gone through abuse. You've been, like what I'm going to share this morning, I know can have for some a triggering effect, others, uh, whatever. But, but here's what you've got to know, man. What I'm sharing today is coming from the word of God. It's, it, it is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And I believe it is profitable for us. All of scripture is profitable, including the cool stuff that I get to talk about today. And so what I know is there are probably some two extremes of people I'm talking about, even who are Christians. There are, Chris, there, are, there are people here today that you have a pagan view of sex. And I'm gonna talk more about this as we, as we jump in, but your, your view of sex is, I mean, it's just something, it's an urge that we have. And so, you know, take care of the urge. And, and like, you don't have any conviction as to how you, you take care of that. On the other hand, uh, there's, there's another extreme and this is probably uh, among uh, many of you who are, several of you who are Christians, I call it the prude view of sex. Like sex is dirty, terrible, horrible. Save it for the one you love. And like, I mean, that is like just terrible. And so we're gonna talk about that because that's not biblical. Either one of those are not biblical. And, uh, and, and so we're just gonna do some, some, some digging today. Now, I know that when, when we talk about this, people are like, well, you know, that's just something that should be between a husband and wife. And I, I get that on one hand. Like, I mean, if you ever invite Lori and I over for dinner, there's not gonna be a time that like between dip and chips and salsa, I'm like, so how's the sex life? Like, I'm not... I'm not ever going to do that, right? Like that's, that is, that would just be weird. But on the other hand, what I think is that the church has done people disservice because we, we, we like to talk about Ephesians chapter five and the whole love and respect and submission thing. But, but like we, we just, we run away from first Corinthians chapter seven. Because 1 Corinthians chapter seven, it's what I love about the, the gospel is it not, man, not only does the word teach us that Jesus Christ came and died and he rose again so that we could be forgiven from our sins, but, but we can also know that we can break free from our sins and the Bible even gives instruction on how we should live. And here's what I believe, the gospel touches every part of our lives, every part, not just our soul, not just the spiritual, it impacts the emotional, the physical. And I believe that today God has something that he wants to teach us. I believe that we can live holy, righteous lives in a broken, cursed, and sinful world, not because we're that good, but because the Holy Spirit is that awesome and because what Jesus Christ did is that powerful. So let's dive in. First verse, chapter seven. 
Paul starts off writing, he says, now concerning the matters about which you wrote, so let me just pause here. What we know is that there is a letter we don't have access to. They, they were asking questions and um, we, we do know that there were four specific questions or at least four areas they were asking questions about because after in chapters one through six, Paul kind of laying the foundation for where he's gonna go with his answers. In seven through 11, he answers these questions specifically. The first question they had had to do with marriage. Uh, men with sex, with singleness, with divorce, what do you do uh, with, you know, remarriage and, and all of that. He, he, you know, he addresses that in chapter seven. Uh, chapters eight through 10 deal with this big issue of like P Gentiles are getting saved. They weren't raised Christian. They used to worship at the temple. They worshiped idols. So some of those practices were, were still part of their lives and maybe even bleeding into the church. What do we do about that? He addresses that. And then uh, apparently some, <laughs> some women, and we don't know the specific situation, but some women were getting rowdy in worship. And so it's like, how do we address this? He addresses that in chapter 11, but then also what takes place, you know, how, how should we take the Lord's Supper? This, is this supposed to be a big feast? There's some, some crazy stuff that was going on. He addresses that in, in chapter 11. But the first question he's gonna hit uh, here has to do specifically with, with marriage. Now, I, I, I'm gonna ask permission for something. I say, I'm probably gonna do it anyway. But anyway, I'm gonna ask permission. Um, I, I don't think that I can get to the entire chapter. Actually, I know I can't get to the entire chapter today. They, when the sermon prep team had put this together, they gave me chapter seven, which is awesome. And I'm glad that I get to teach this while they're away at youth camp. Um, but <laughs> but um, there, there's no way that I can hit divorce and remarriage and widowhood and, and, and singleness and, and all of that, as well as uh, God's gift of sex. And so if you guys are cool with this, I, I, I'm gonna, when I come back, I'm probably supposed to be in like 1 Corinthians 11 or something like that. I'm just hitting pause and I'm actually gonna come back because I think the church needs to have a, a biblical understanding of singleness, of what, it, what widowhood, of divorce, of remarriage. We need to understand what the word of God says. Are you guys cool with that? So I'm a, I'm a come back. We will come back to this, but I, I want to hit this first part. Now, the reason why this marriage thing was probably in their letter was because it was really complex. It was a complex issue in the church. Um, there were four types of marriage. If you study um, Roman history in, in this period, in Corinth, I'm sure the church is no different. There, was, uh, th there were slave marriages that were arranged by slave owners. And so like, for instance, if, if slaves, you know, male and female slave wanted to be tent mates, uh, he, you know, he'd let them have that right perhaps. But, but here was the thing, the owner could at any time decide to split up this quote unquote marriage. He could sell off the wife or sell off the husband. And, there, and so there, we know from Paul's letters, there are slaves in, in this church. So they're, they're wanting to honor God. I mean, like, what do they do? Can we get remarried? Can, well, what do we do here? How, how do we handle this? There was another marriage and uh, that was where a guy uh, receives a dowry for his, uh, you know, for his daughter, you know, like you pay so many camels or, or goats or whatever. And, and this still happens, by the way. We, we were in uh, Kenya a little while ago and I was coming back uh, from our, the school that we started in Molo back to Nairobi and our driver was telling us uh, he had been courting a, a girl for five years and his plan was to marry her. And I'm like, dude, what's taking you so long? He's like, I'm saving for five camels. I'm like, Whoa. He's like, yeah. He said, in the part of Kenya that I'm from, he said, you have to pay a dowry. So I'm saving and I will get married when I've saved enough money for five camels. So you know, that's pretty impressive though. Like, like, come on ladies, to be a five camel wife, that's pretty impressive right there. I mean, that's, that is good. That's good. Anyway, has nothing to do with my message. Uh, so, so we got those marriages. We've got, uh, We've got kind of something similar to a common law thing where if you've, if you've lived together for a year or so, you're, they were considered in Roman culture to be, to, to be married. And then there was you know, kind of the, the high form of marriage where the Romans had this ceremony and, and all of that and, and it was very official and you know, certified and all that. In fact, I've done a lot of marriages. I don't know if you know this, but our wedding ceremonies today have 
very little, if anything, to do with, with Old Testament or New Testament wedding ceremonies. Almost every element of a Christian wedding ceremony today came from a Roman wedding ceremony. Maid of honor, a bridal bouquet, uh, joining right hands, re- reciting vows, taking rings. Like even when they were done with, with the ceremony, they would go to a different location and they would eat. Any idea what they would eat? Cake. I'm telling you, like even the reception, thank God for the Romans. Like, like, but again, you know, here's my point. They have all these different types of marriages. And so obviously there's some questions like, what do we do? And then when you add to this that, that there was this whole thing of, of uh, concubinage. And, and that, that, what, what I mean by this, a guy, uh, a husband could, could marry a wife and, and her responsibility was to have kids clean the house, put food on the table and all of that. And then he could go out and have a mistress and do whatever he wanted because women didn't have a lot of rights in, in uh, Roman culture. And, and, and so there's that issue. And then divorce was just prevalent. In fact, I came across some, uh, I came, I came across some uh, oh, historical records. There were people who were married 27 or 28 times in Rome. Can you imagine? Like, I mean, just like a revolving door. Some of you are like, yeah, I know that person. Like, I, like I, my, my point is this, there are some issues that have to be addressed. So what's the church to do? They can't change the rules of Rome. Church has no clout. What are they to do? Paul provides insight. Here's what they, here's what they came up with. Because I want you to notice that what I'm going to read is in quotations. Now, concerning the matters about which you wrote, verse one, quote, here's what they wrote to Paul. It is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. That's their plan. Let's just get rid of sex. And we, then that clears up all the issues. Let's just say no. Just say no. Nancy Reagan. Like, like that's, that's what they're saying here. This, this is not what Paul's saying. Paul is quoting what they wrote. And what Paul is going to do is he's going to respond and he's, he's not gonna embrace the pagan view of marriage. He's not gonna emba- embrace the prude view of marriage. He's going to teach them what a Christian marriage really looks like because the church way too long has been the church of no. And what we do is we just put laws in place because we, w- we don't wanna deal with hard questions. Hello, you know I'm right. Well, don't, just don't ask questions, just believe. Hold on a second. If God is God and the word is the word, then it should be able to be held up to questions. We should be able to ask questions. And so what Paul does, he's like, well, hold on a second. No, we're gonna deal with the sanctity of marriage. What does a Christian marriage really look like? And here's how he begins in verse two. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. Some of you guys did not know that was in the Bible. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now, here's what I'm gonna do. For the next few minutes, I'm gonna focus on these five verses, okay? And I'm gonna do this because I, I, I want us to understand that God speaks to every area of life, including sex. And that sex is not something that we need to avoid or we gotta be scared about within the church to not talk about. Like it's here. He, the gospel touches everything, including sex. And there are two general principles that I'm going to provide, but I, listen, I know that there's a lot of different people here today, a lot of different backgrounds, and I cannot provide caveats for every single situation in this message, right? There are gonna be people like, well, what if? Like, I can't hit all of the what ifs. Let me just say that the intent, as Paul is writing, he is giving general principles, knowing that his audience that he's writing to, they're Christians, So first of all, he's writing to Christians. If you're not a Christian today, I I want you to listen because you need to know what should separate a Christian view of sex from a pagan view of sex, but but he's writing to Christians. But first of all, he's writing generally to what would be healthy marriages or, or 
It shouldn't be a marriage where there's like sexual abuse, physical abuse, or, or anything like that. So I just want to say this. Like, if you're in this thing where somebody is gaslighting you, manipulating you, uh, abusing your kids or whatever, you, you need to get out of that, that situation. If you don't know where to start, guess what? I love, I love you. Know, we'll help. And what I mean by that, we'll, man, we'll point you to resources, we'll, we'll stand with you, but I'm not talking to people that are in this abusive, weird, jacked up, sinful type of, of marriage where, where you're being victimized, okay? So I wanna be very clear about that. But everybody else, listen up. I'm not writing to those with a perfect marriage, but I'm writing to those who generally, you, man, you want to have a healthy marriage. The first principle that Paul's gonna give us throughout the, the chapter seven, and I'm gonna come back and hit more fully uh, later, but, I, but it, it sheds light on where we're going. The first principle is this. If you're married, God's plan is that you embrace your status as married, okay? If, if you're married, and again, this, I, I want you read through 1 Corinthians chapter seven this week. You're going to see the context for what I'm saying here, but I've got to share this to get to what I'm going to hit next. In, in essence, what, what you're going to see Paul say here in this chapter is don't break up your marriage because you're a Christian. Now, listen, I know that there are some of you, you have regrets about from, from the past. You wish the origin story of your marriage was something different than what it was. Maybe you got married, not like the timing of it what wouldn't have been your own choosing. Or the circumstances weren't what you, uh, what, what you consider righteous, holy, or good. Now, I get that there's a natural regret, but can I tell you that when we live focused on the past, obsessive regret with what with, with maybe the, the start that you didn't have, you're totally missing out that because you are in Christ, God provides redemption, not just for your soul, but for your marriage. And though something didn't start a certain place, doesn't mean that God in his grace can't give you something that is incredible. And so I will tell you, marriage is something that we should embrace. There is no such thing as a perfect marriage. You gotta know that. I thought Lori was gonna say amen there. But anyway, uh, no such thing as a perfect marriage, right? But, but marriage is this union of two imperfect people. And if, you, if both spouses are Christians, man, you, first of all, you're, you're seeking first, man, God to follow him. But then you're seeking the good, you, you, you want this. Now, do we get jacked up and, and miss the boat? Do we sin and, and, and fall and, and hurt one another along the way? Yeah. There are times that happens, but, but we're going to address that as well. But, but, but can I tell you that even if you're married to a not, if you're a Christian married to non Christians, man, literally Paul's going to go on to say that, man, your, your marriage is made holy because you belong to God. And so, so the first thing, man, if, 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 if you're married, embrace God's plan as you embrace your status. Now, second, this is where we're gonna spend the majority of our time this morning. If you're married, God's plan is that you pursue and enjoy sexual intimacy, okay? Like some of you are like, man, I feel guilty writing this down on my sermon guide. No, listen, if you're married, God's plan is that you pursue and enjoy sexual intimacy, there are some messed up, messed up myths that Christians have believed across the years when it comes to sex within, and that's a key word, within marriage. Now listen, uh, Paul, Paul's been very clear to uh, define the you know, sexual immorality outside of marriage. But there are times that, that we, we in the church have just ignored what scripture says and we've embraced all these, these things and, and our, we've let our perspective not be shaped by scripture, but by culture, by, uh, by maybe shame from our past or by our, you know, what we saw in our home growing up or, or maybe... Maybe even this false sense of spirituality, like, well, you know, if you, if you need sex, there's something wrong with you. Well, hold on a second. I think if you don't, well, anyway, I got to keep moving. Here, here, here's the thing that I want to address. The question is this. I mean, why does God encourage sex within a marriage? Why does he do it? I had a, 
I had, there was a Bible college professor that I never took his class, but one of my friends told me he said this, and he didn't last the college very long, but he was like 80 some years old, they said. And uh, he got up and he said, students, sex is only for procreation, not recreation. And I'm like, yeah, I don't believe that. Like, I, like uh, but that's part of it. I mean, yeah, God has, uh, that's a mean by which, it means by which you bring kids, obviously. But that's, but that's not the, why he encouraged sex within marriage. I think there are three basic things, okay? And so you, I, want, I want you to write these down. I'm gonna hit these and we'll get out of here. Number one, he says right here, one of the reasons is to help fight temptation, to help fight temptation. And this is where this whole prude and pagan thing comes in. Like, I don't know if you've ever heard the, you know, you've heard the word platonic, platonic relationship. What's that referring to? It's referring to a relationship without sex. Now, the word platonic, if you know anything about Greek culture, it came from a guy, a philosopher by the name of Plato. And Plato and his followers had this idea that the body is evil and that the, that the soul is, is good. And so anything that has to do with the body is, is sick and all that sort of thing. You need to focus on the soul, not the body. So if, you, if you're consumed with, with sex, that you know, you're, you're messed up, there's something wrong with you and all that. So that's where this whole thing, platonic, they believe that if you had you know, arrived, you come to this higher, this higher level, if you will, uh, you know, sex wouldn't be part of that platonic relationship. Well, that, that's not at all what what scripture teaches. But then there's a pagan view that said, man, you can just do anything. In fact, they pretty much deified sex. It was part of worship rituals. It's like, man, it's a natural appetite. You just respond, you do whatever you want to do. Well, listen, just because you have an appetite doesn't mean that you can do whatever you want to do. Like at some point, uh, like your, your little kids that are eating, you know, McDonald's French fries and chicken nuggets, if that, that's all they eat the rest of their life, there's probably gonna be some damage. That's not the, always the healthiest way to curb an appetite. Now I get, you gotta survive till like seven. So I like, you got grace, you got grace. Like I get it, right? But what I'm saying is we, we get that in food. Well, the same thing is true. We, we don't, it's not always healthy to, to curb the sexual appetite by just chasing, you know, whatever. And so in, in chapters five and six, Paul is very, very clear. He defines what sexual immorality is. He, he actually, man, he, he very clearly says, this is what God intends. And, and, and he, he makes it clear, flee sexual immorality. Flee fulfilling sex in a sinful way outside of a committed covenant relationship between a man and a woman, between a husband and wife. Flee this. Like he, he doesn't mince words. I'm not gonna re-preach that. He just, he refutes the pagan, you know, the pagan take. But, but what we know as we, as we dig in here is that somehow the church had embraced the prude view the platonic view. Listen, we're just gonna deal with the problem by forbidding this all together, by, by teaching that, like, like having sexual relation, uh, having intimacy, that, that's wrong, just don't do it. And Paul's like, no, that's not it. I mean, he, he, embr he embraced the, the Nike mantra, just do it. Like you need to do, like this is, this is a good thing. And one of the many reasons was we have these, these sexual things and just because you have an appetite, like that doesn't make, just because it can be abused doesn't make the appetite wrong. God created our bodies so they fit together. God created our bodies even so we get pleasure. Like this was God's idea. God came up with this, God created us. Don't call what God created bad. He's the creator, but the reality is it can be perverted and taken advantage of, but it doesn't make it wrong. And so he, he's saying, man, he said, one of the things is like, you, actually, this is a means by which you can help one another stay holy because the reality is sexual temptation does not go away once you're married. Hate to break it to you, singles. Just, it just doesn't go away. It is still there. <laughs> my dad, I'm throwing this in for free. Uh, my my dad was a pastor for a while and um, they were in a Bible study group and I don't even know how it came up. They were talking about temptation and one of the young guys said, oh, my goodness, he goes, is there ever, and is, is there ever an age that you arrive at where you don't have to battle this? And an older ex-pastor sitting at the table, he said, well, I can tell you one thing, it's not 80. And so I'm like, well, there you go.
No, but what God does is he, he, he gives us intimacy. It's a good thing. It's a healthy thing. It's a, it's a beautiful thing, but it's also a purposeful thing by which we can even live holy in this life. Now, is it, is it possible to even screw up sex within marriage between Christians? Yeah. And Hebrews, that's why Hebrews is very clear. Let the marriage bed be undefiled. Like he says that in chapter 13, verse four, like, like, like for instance, I, I'm just gonna throw this out there. It's not in the scripture, but you like, if you gotta bring porn into a relationship to spice things up in the bedroom, that's, that's not of God. Like that's, that's sinful, that's, that's messed up. But, but the sex, the, the intimacy between a husband and wife, that is a, that's a good thing. Don't, don't call bad what God created for good. But, but it's, it's more than that. It's more than that. It's, it's also to provide a tangible expression of, of sacrificial love. God's given us intimacy to provide a tangible expression of sacrificial love. And so here's, here's what you need to know as a, as a Christian spouse. And you've been given this incredible opportunity to give yourself to your spouse in a, in a way that actually glorifies God. It just sounds weird because like that's the, it's almost like we think God can see everything except he doesn't see the bedroom. But that's just not true. God actually delights when we are who he's created us to be. And so what Paul is saying here is something you've maybe never heard. And I just want to say this and I get a little awkward on the ride home with your spouse. Paul is saying that celibacy is wrong within a marriage. The only caveat that he puts in here is that if there's common consent between a husband and wife and it's for spiritual reasons, then sure. Now listen, again, I know Paul's not thinking people that have their certain physical issues or whatever that it might be, and I'm not gonna get into all that, okay? But I would say that if there is not common consent when it comes to this thing, you need to submit your understanding or your preferences to the word of God. Now, that does not mean that if your spouse is aggressively or abusively trying to manipulate or take advantage of you, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about within a healthy, God-honoring marriage where you're both wanting to seek the good of each other, the good of God, celibacy, isn't just, it's not like, it's like a recommendation. He's just saying, don't do this. It's really quiet here. I sweat, I sweat a lot during this message. Um, like, I don't know how any straighter to say it than the way he put it. Husbands, your body doesn't belong to you. It belongs to your wife. Um, Man, I don't want to be crude or fun. I'm not saying this to be fun. I don't know how else to say it. Um, <laughs> don't send me emails. Um, guys, your, your v idea of what it means to have intimacy and, and to make love is not the rodeo version, if you know what I'm talking about, where it's all about you getting your enjoyment and then we're out. No, it's, there's something beautiful. I, I, it was not planned. I had no idea. It's just in my Bible reading plan. I happened this week as I'm studying for this message. The, where the, my plan is taking me in my devotional reading was in Song of Solomon. And I'm just gonna tell you, Song of Solomon is not a spiritual allegory. It's actually a celebration of a gift that God has given. And he is very clear that intimacy is to be enjoyed within the proper boundaries. And so husbands, your body doesn't belong to you. Wives, your body doesn't belong to you. It belongs to your husband. And, and which is crazy because in this time, 
There, there were a lot of women who didn't have a lot of rights. And what Paul is doing is he's raising men and women up as, as equals. And he's saying that both of you have a responsibility. And I, I've, I've mentioned this in a lot of different wedding ceremonies I've performed. I've, I've told the bride and groom, you walked in here as individuals, but when you walk out, you're gonna walk out together. And there's something powerful about that. Because the last thing that I would say to you is this, sex is given to symbolize the oneness of marriage, the, the oneness of marriage. You see, when you, when you say I do, you take your vows, you do the thing, I, I pronounce you husband and wife, and everybody claps and cheers as the two of you walk down the aisle. What's happened? You're walking down the aisle in a weird sort of way, part of you has died. You haven't died to your personality. You're, you're the same person. But what I'm saying is you have willingly sacrificed your capacity to be single. You've willingly sacrificed your capacity to seek your own good. It's all, life's about you and, and all that sort of thing. You've willingly agreed to become one and, and, and you're walking out as, as one. Marriage is sacrificial, but I believe it's sacrificial because of the oneness that God intended. Sex is God's way of a husband to say to a wife or a wife to say to a husband, I belong completely and exclusively to you. Now listen, if you use sex to say anything else, you're making it out to be a lie. But this physical intimacy is saying we are one in every arena of life, including the physical. It go, you, you can go all the way back to Genesis chapter two to see that's the way that God intended this. And I wanna be careful, but the, it is possible for spouses to damage their marriage and maybe even unconsciously violate God's intention for their marriage by playing games with sex. Sex is not given to you as power to wield over your spouse. I'll give you a treat if you do what I want you to do. Sex is not intended to be this thing that can be leveraged by one spouse or the other. Physical intimacy is given as a gift from God to emphasize and show that God's idea is the best idea, that it's a selfless, sacrificial, incredible partnership that God has purposefully created. Why in the world would God put these five verses in scripture? It's because Marriage isn't your plan, it's God's plan. Sex isn't about your desire. It's formed and it begins with his desire. You know, in Ephesians chapter five, towards the end in verse 32, Paul's asking this question. He's like, man, what, what, what is marriage all about? Why was marriage established? What? What's its purpose? And, and, and he says something crazy in, in, in 32, in verse 32, that marriage is actually given to symbolize and to be a testimony of Christ's love for his church. And if you think about it, you step back and you look all of scripture, you go to the Old Testament, especially the prophets, time and time again, God uses marriage language when he talks about him being the husband and his chosen people, Israel, being his bride. We go to the New Testament and again, we'll find this language. Christ is the husband. His church is the bride. I believe that a healthy marriage testifies to and points to a holy God who deeply, cares and loves his bride. 
When you think about that, it elevates marriage to not just something as two imperfect people fighting or trying to figure out how we're going to budget and, you know, what night we're going to have sex. Or it's not the, any of that. In fact, I believe that it's interesting because there is language of intimacy found in the Old Testament. In fact, there are places in which it's talking about God as, as the husband and Israel as the wife, where it, like, it, it's tough to read at times because it's a little explicit. And I believe that even intimacy between a husband and wife is a model and a foretaste of the ecstasy of one day knowing Christ perfectly. I like how Tim Keller put it. He said, in heaven, when we know him face to face and we enter into a union of love with him and all the other people who love him, on that great day, there's gonna be a deep delight and a towering joy and a deep security of such nature that the most incredible sex between a man and a woman is just an echo of it. Now, is there going to be sex in heaven? No, because there's not marriage in heaven. And you're like, well, I don't want to go. Well, hold on. <laughs> Here's, when, when, he, when he says this, that the, that the most incredible sex between a man and a woman is just an echo of it, don't miss it. It is an echo. And what I mean by this is this incredible joy and pleasure that comes from the most beautiful private moments between a husband and wife that, that incredible thrill and closeness that, that you have in that moment is, is on a much higher level going to be something that we have for all of eternity. That's why the, the, the old hymn writers, and it's actually, it's found in scripture, they use the word rapture or ecstasy when talking about what's gonna take place in heaven. That's not sexually charged language, but it's interesting how it's the same words that describe the closest thing that we can think to here. Heaven is going to blow our minds, but what God has given us is a beautiful down payment on what is yet to come. Now I've got a lot more to get to and I'll get to it later, but let me close by, by, by saying this. And I'll have a lot of time to get into this. Um, but there, uh, when, I, when I preach this and I talk about this, there might be some of you that wrestle and struggle with what I've said. And, feel, and in all seriousness, like if you have questions, don't just get frustrated. Or whatever. Man, email me. Uh, it might take me a while to get emails. because I'm still on sabbatical, but I will get back to you. And, and, but in that way, you don't forget the question. But you feel, feel free to reach out. But there might be some of you are like, man, I, I don't think my marriage can ever be that because of, and maybe it's, your spouse's unfaithfulness, or maybe you were unfaithful, or maybe you guys have this past or, or, or something, and you're like, it can never be that. Um, I, don't, I don't think God can, can do this. No, hold on a second, man. God can redeem anything. And I'm glad that there are stories like uh, Jesus' encounter with Mary Magdalene, somebody who had a sexual past in Scripture. He did not leave that out of Scripture. He redeemed her. She's, she's even at the cross there, there at the end. But I, I want to carefully just, you guys just need to know this. The pastor that's on this platform, I don't, have a, I don't have a perfect record in the past. In fact, one of the toughest conversations I had to have with Lori before I asked her to marry, with, marry me was I wanted her to know that I had a lot of regrets that came from my sexual sin and other relationships. I wanted to make, and I want to make sure that she was... She understood all of this before we got married. And here's what I know, that that shame doesn't just always automatically go away once you're married. There are times what Satan wants to do is he wants to break up the intimacy, not just with God. He wants to break up the intimacy with your spouse. And so what he'll do is he'll bring up your past and say, because of what you did, this is who you are. You can't enjoy marriage. What, what, what God gives us as a picture of marriage can't be enjoyed by you. Guys, it's a lie. It's a lie. And what we have to stop doing is following our feelings when Satan says that's who you were and instead rest our confidence on the fact that we have been forgiven and what, what Pastor Matt uh, brought out last week, man, we have been cleansed. We have been washed. We are new. And that newness is what 
makes what I've talked about possible, even within a marriage. And so just know that God's not through with you. Singles, I promise you, I'm getting back to the singleness. Divorced, I'm gonna get back and hit the divorce thing. But I would just say this, to go back to a verse that we read last week in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 on into 20, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. Glorify God in your body. Father, thank you so much that scripture not only teaches us that we can be forgiven, teaches us and and provides context on what Christ did to make that possible. But God, you also give us practical instruction on how we can now live. And so God, I pray that you would strengthen the marriages within our congregation. Dear God, I pray that, that we would submit ourselves to the word of God that we would carefully look at scripture, not just take the word of man, look at scripture. What does your word say? And submit ourselves to your word. But God, I, I pray that, man, our marriages would experience love and growth. And then God, on the other hand, if, man, if we're messing around, if, we, if we're broken, may we understand that we can be forgiven. And I pray that there would be repentance that marks those who have been chasing something illicitly, something you intended for our good. But God, would you restore Would you redeem and for what you're going to continue to do to make us new until that day when all will be made new and we're with you for alternative. We'll thank you for this. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Amen. You're dismissed.